bottom tier on the right. And uh, it, I acknowledge that it is not the most uh, ideally displayed in its current uh, location because it was moved from the West Asia galleries and space made for it in that particular case, but um, if that, that current location is not ideally set up for uh, getting the object lit the way it deserves. So uh, I have plans, if things uh, permit, to move the location within that same case, but to move it to a place where we can get it uh, better lit and therefore for uh, the body inscription to be more visible. And um, I don't know how these, exactly how it's going to work, but uh, perhaps to get some type of a magnification I don't know. So, uh, but for now, until further notice, it is where it is. And um, hopefully you will notice it now that you uh, know where to look. Okay. So, why were the Mughals collecting Timurid objects? And just as they want, you know, to get ourselves back into this, the Timurids were ruling over greater Iran in the 15th century. They uh, succeeded the Mongols uh, who were in that region f in the 14th century. And the Mughals are in India in the 16th century. So there are three um, distinct regions and periods. Two regions, three periods. And uh, the word Mughal is, uh, is also a derivative of Mongol. So the, there's a, it's all very confusing probably, but uh, the Mughals very systematically, again, take on this title from their predecessors. Although uh, in their own records, they call themselves uh, Khandane Timuria or House of Timur. So usually they refer to themselves as the House of Timur. So what you see here is a 18th century uh, painting made for the Emperor Aurangzeb, which shows the House of Timur. And this next slide is a crazy confusing one, but with all these uh, arrows flying around, but the point was to illustrate how actively and consciously they thought themselves to be part of this uh, bigger constellation that had to do with a dynasty that preceded them by about a hundred years in a slightly different geographic location. But here in India in the 16th century, they are carrying on that line, and carrying on that line very precisely and very programmatically. So uh, this is just one example of several, several variations on these uh, dynastic portraits, which invariably feature Timur at the head and handing his crown to whoever the successor may be. Uh, be it Akbar, be it Jahangir, be it Shah Jahan, be it Babur, be it whoever. But uh, this uh, 18th century painting uh, for Emperor Aurangzeb seen here is uh, perhaps the one that really captures the entire line. So usually all these three or sometimes even the fourth, th these guys in between Timur and Babur are eliminated from the picture. But uh, here they all are in their glory. And, uh, the artists maintain a convention of uh, facial or um, costume distinction in order to uh, show Homayun and Babur with these Central Asian-ish figures and Homayun always wears a distinctive headdress that uh, is very noticeable. And then uh, everybody else is in uh, costumes of at least the Indian rulers are in the costumes of their time. Uh, every so often you find Timur, kind of sort of Indian, sort of Persian, somewhere in between. Again, visually forging this relationship that uh, the world of Greater Iran of the Timurids is not that far away from the world of India of the Mughals. 
Oh, and note here these Chinese blue and white vases. So um, the, the, Timur, uh, the Mughals, again, uh, maintained uh, many different ways of uh, this legitimation and connecting with the past while creating a new uh, worldview for the present. So the present was as important as the past was, but the present got validation by coming from a distinguished past. And uh, for example, the Akbar Nama, uh, the uh, hi official history of Akbar opens with uh, an account of this miraculous birth of uh, Genghis Khan, uh, which by a mythical, his mother, um, Alan Kuwa, who was impregnated by a beam of light that came through the tent. And, um, and so that was the kind of story of the birth of Genghis. Timur's cenotaph also includes that same account. The Akbar Nama opens with that same account. So there are all these multiple allusions uh, to um, kind of supernatural, out, outside of the world of, um, of this world that are infused, very subtly infused, and then very propagandistically infused as well. And they all, together build the aura of the emperor. But in addition to that, uh, like the Timurids, the Mughals used uh, their patronage of art and culture as a way of uh, expressing their position, expressing their interests, and really making themselves a part of the here and now. So uh, what you're seeing here is a painting of uh, the Mughal atelier where um, artists, calligraphers, book, uh, a paper burnisher, and many other craftspeople are working together in a single environment. This was also what we had seen for the Timurid Kitab Khane, or uh, manuscript production workshops. The Mughals actively collected uh, art that was made for the Timurids. What you see here is a painting from uh, Shahnameh, the Persian Book of Kings, made for Muhammad Juki, one of uh, Timur's grandsons, uh, which was owned by the Mughal emperors. It bears the seal of uh, several of the Mughal emperors, including Akbar. And uh, so they were collecting manuscripts, they were collecting objects that uh, had known associations with the Timurid princely house. And it was these types of uh, paintings that also uh, created a new uh, vision for uh, the Mughal, very distinctively Mughal uh, painting styles. And by the time you're through with this, I hope you're not utterly confused, but hopefully you will be able to see the difference between um, Persian painting and Indian painting because there are several pairings coming up. Um, the, the collecting was not only of existing objects, but there was also some reworking. So additions made to, uh, to these manuscripts, to these objects. And for example, here is a, a a calligraphic page written by one of the Timurid uh, art artists whose work is assigned here, Mir Ali Haravi. And Mir Ali Haravi, like Sultan Ali Mashadi, we saw some of their uh, works uh, before the break, were very highly respected and celebrated as calligraphers in their own time, but then also by the Mughals. So how, uh, uh, but, the interlinear painting here of plants and animals and uh, all the birds were uh, Mughal editions. So uh, new borders would be added, uh, new pages would be uh, created for these albums, and these uh, calligraphic examples, paintings, were assembled in custom-made albums for uh, especially Jahangir and his son, Shah Jahan. But, and then these were considered as family heirlooms and so uh, moved from six, uh, generation to generation as highly valued objects. This is another example of a spinel, 
a ruby that has the names of um, Ulugh Beg and uh, several other um, Timurid rulers as well as here we see Jahangir. So uh, there is uh, an, an interest and a motivation to build on the past and to kind of add their own selves physically uh, as by way of objects, but physically onto uh, valued objects of the past. Now, how were the Mughals getting these uh, things? Uh, they were known to have an interest in this and uh, in this material, and so we're receiving a lot of these objects as did gifts from uh, from a variety of sources, uh, mostly uh, people of Persian and Central Asian origin, who were uh, who had access to these uh, objects and and the likes of Jahangir record in his memoirs, so-and-so came from XYZ place and brought me a gift of this, which had the name of Ulugh Beg Gurgan on it, and I was so thrilled with it that uh, I ordered my, uh, my court calligraphers to, uh, I'm sorry, jewelers to add an inscription with my name on them and to add my father's name on it. So a lot of the pieces that uh, have uh, the name of Akbar uh, were not, were, some of them were added posthumously by Jahangir in order to kind of maintain that uh, recognition of descent. Akbar was not really known to have uh, inscribed uh, objects with his name. And here is that magnificent uh, Ulugh Beg jug, which uh, has the name of uh, Ulugh Beg uh, inscribed around the neck. And you can sort of see the family resemblance between uh, that inscription and the inscription on our cup. And uh, around the rim here is uh, an inscription with uh, Jahangir's name and then another inscription that was added later by uh, Shah Jahan. So here's where the Art History 101 quiz comes. But uh, on the left will be Persian paintings, and here will be um, 16th, uh, 17th century, mostly 17th century per Indian paintings, 15th century Persian paintings. But um, in a lot of their um, practices, as well as in what survives through paintings, uh, the Mughals continued with uh, Timurid practices. We see that in political systems and in administrative policies, but we also see that in the arts. So like uh, the, the Timurids who were known to have surrounded themselves uh, and invited and encouraged the participation at uh, literary gatherings at court, uh, well-respected poets and um, Sufis of various kinds. Uh, likewise, we see Dara Shiko, one of the princes of the Mughal house, also uh, at an assembly with uh, learned individuals. And we see that they are ulema or uh, scholars of some kind because of their long beards. Uh, and where prominently we have books in, included in the gathering. And, uh, Similar types of composition, similar types of settings, uh, where it is, uh, this is set in an outdoor pavilion with a palace or architectural setting behind, verdant gardens nearby, attendants all around, and we see uh, a relationship in that same uh, compositional elements. However, stylistically, they are completely different. Uh, the ways in which the figures are uh, rendered, the ways in which colors are used, the ways in which um, spatial relations are made between individual elements in the picture, um, the kind of modeling and shading that we see in uh, many of these Mughal paintings, they, they create a markedly different and distinctive appearance. Uh, uh, an interest in Persian classics, uh, here we have uh, the, the famous story of Laila and Majnoon by uh, the Persian poet Nizami uh, that is uh, copies of these manuscripts were made uh, for the Timurid uh, royalty but then also for the Mughal royalty. And actually this painting will be in pearls on a string so keep an eye out for it when you see it. But uh, again, 
um, the types of uh, this, the, the spatial recession, the treatment of um, a landscape, the treatment of uh, flora and fauna are all very distinctively uh, Mughal uh, elements. Yet there is an overall sense of lush patterning, even though it's more obvious here. But when you look at the ways in which these rocks are treated, there is a great deal of interest in the surface and a great deal of interest in just uh, the luxuriance. Luxuriance is conveyed through uh, various strategies. There is also an interest in collecting uh, objects. These are both from the Shah Jahan period, collecting and making of luxury objects. Uh, we've seen this already a couple of times. Uh, this dish is in our collection, not on view right now, but it's a Ming dish uh, that was uh, an export ware, but collected by Shah Jahan, and his name is uh, on the back of this dish. Even when it comes to building, and uh, building and architecture is perhaps the most visible ways of uh, expressing a place in the world and position, manuscripts such as these would have had a, a more restricted access. Uh, it would be available to the inner circles, uh, if that much, of the elite culture and uh, largely for personal enjoyment of the emperors and their uh, court, but uh, it was the building, the architecture that was most publicly visible. And here, uh, this is a, a historical text uh, written after the death of Timur, but which is about, it's called the Book of Victories, Safarname, but which recounts the uh, life of Timur and his achievements. And uh, here is a page from the Akbarnama, uh, Book of uh, the History of Akbar, both of them are are showing an active uh, building activity and the ruler's participation in this and the, in the kind of mobilizing of resources that uh, would have these, and these large-scale projects would have required. Now, whether the large-scale projects are magnificent architecture or if they are uh, elaborate luxury books, it still requires uh, availability of uh, economic and manpower and skilled manpower resources, and then having a vision that brings them all together and allows them to be expressed in a effective way. And so even in architecture, we see the ways in which uh, Mughal architecture is uh, drawing in many ways on uh, Persian Timurid prototypes, but then doing something very distinctively Indian. So while one can never really confuse an Indian building for a Persian building, there, there are echoes that remain. So here is uh, the entrance to the mosque at Fatehpur Sikri, which was uh, Akbar's capital for a while. And this is the Matrasa complex made for Uluq Beg in uh, Samarkand. And so we see elements such as these tall ivans, uh, attacks or doorways, uh, which are deeply recessed with the architectural structure, a domed structure behind it, arcades lining and uh, the exterior facade. So uh, yet these chhatris are very Indian. Uh, the shapes of the domes are distinctively Indian, and the ways in which these then relate to the rest of the building behind it become quite uh, distinctive, and as I say, one cannot really confuse the two, but you see the echoes, and the kind of grand finale in all of this is uh, the Taj Mahal here, which is uh, very closely um, uh, inspired by the tomb of Timur, the Guremir in Samarkand, and the chief architect of the Taj Mahal was also a Persian architect. So um, there are echoes, there are resonances, there are adaptations, and there are variations, but which all together uh, manage to create a, rec a familiarity, yet then create a very distinctive expression. So uh, this 
the Mughals were interested in the Timurids because they needed to reassert themselves and establish themselves in the new landscape of India as a cosmopolitan, powerful, intellectual rulers. And uh, which is why they, they drew upon their Persianate uh, background and also incorporated and synthesized Indian elements in order to really stake a claim on, on uh, their new homeland of India, which by this time is no longer that new, but still. So now for the last bits of this uh, talk, I will return to the cup and uh, jump from all of that back to Jahangir and the function of this cup. Uh, um, much of our, in several books, because this uh, cup has been widely published, let's stay here for a minute. Uh, the cup has been widely published in various sources, especially any discussion of the Murid Jades, uh, our cup is in, in those books. Any discussion on Mughal Jades, our cup is there too. In many of these sources, this uh, cup has been described as a casket. And in fact, in even in uh, the museum's cataloging system, it's been uh, described as a casket. And it has had a, there's been occasional discussion about uh, how does this become a jewel box? And so it's been talked about as a jewel box. So I just want to get into that bit a little um, before we wrap up. So the inscription is what uh, creates that impression of this being a jewel casket. And the word right here uh, called Durj uh, is the culprit. Now the, the, the word Durj uh, appears in uh, in both uh, inscriptions. So Alaudullah's inscription says that uh, the Sultan, son of the Sultan, Alauddin Bahadur Khan, ordered the completion of this Durj. And uh, Jahangir's inscription reads, this life-sustaining jade Durj belongs to Jahangir Shah, son of Akbar Shah, for all, as long as the angels, uh, and the word for casket, which appears again in the Jahangiri expression, is the word hoke, another term for a casket. So as long as the angel's hoke re revolves, may the world remember Jahangir Shah. So the term durj is used in, uh, in these inscriptions and both in Arabic and in Persian, where uh, at least from the 12th century onwards, it has been defined as a, a casket or ornament box used by women to store jewelry. And so uh, our, our labels, cataloging systems, as well as other types of uh, publications have given this cup's um, function and object name as a casket. Yet, I'm sure, I'm guessing it's fairly obvious, but uh, there are several reasons that uh, this descriptor does not work for uh, our cup. One, it is too small in size. Well, one, it's too small in size to hold much. Let's stay there. Uh, it's about this big. I don't know how many jewels you can get in there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, secondly, a casket or a box should have a lid. And uh, this, our cup does not have a lid. It does not have any indications that there would have been a lid. Because if you had a lid, then on the rim of the body of the vessel, there would be some kind of an indentation, perhaps, to accommodate that lid. Uh, here is an object, another jade small cup, bigger than ours, but still small, uh, that w is described as a hoke. Uh, the other term that was used uh, on our inscription. And you can see here that there is a, um, uh, the, the lip has been carved such to accommodate uh, a lid, which we do not have here. It's a very smoothly finished edge. And um, finally, the general shape of this vessel is similar, so similar to drinking vessels seen in Mughal paintings and in Timurid paintings. Uh, however, I have not yet come across a shape quite like this because the drinking cups that we typically see in the Mughal and Timurid con context, uh, sometimes they, they flare at the top uh, or, and they have a, uh, a more pronounced foot, 
which uh, our cup does not have either of those features. But, ooh, sorry, this does, I tried to magnify it so you could see the cup, but not really. So anyhow, this is a painting of uh, 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 entertainment on the court with Jahangir here, and he's holding a white, uh, tiny little cup, and that cup is, uh, looks, he, the way he's holding it suggests that there was a foot that uh, he's holding it from the base. But the size is just right uh, for what our cup would be. Here's another type of example of um, the cups that you would see, and you see their shape. But um, again, uh, Suren Malikian, who's worked very extensively on uh, jades, uh, has, uh, and also studies Persian literature and poetry, has uh, mentioned how uh, there are so many examples in Persian poetry where uh, a rock crystal cup, for example, holding red wine, has been uh, likened to a casket because the wine itself is compared with uh, red spinels or rubies. So this is a very common trope in uh, Persian poetry if, of uh, drinking red wine, the wine is described to jewels, and uh, the cups that hold it are, are called caskets, they're called celestial spheres. Uh, there is also, uh, in this context, a frequent uh, reference to uh, Jamshid, one of the j legendary uh, semi-mythical uh, rulers of ancient Iran who appears prominently in the Shahnameh, and Jamshid had a cup which held wine and which was the all-seeing cup, so it was something like um, a prognostication type of a vessel where he looked into the cup and he could see the world in it. So that phrase and that reference to Jamshid and the reference to wine appears very frequently in a Persian poetry. And. Uh, Another, here again we see examples of wine cups and the whole shape of wine cups. Jahangir again here is shown holding a cup which seems to have a similar shape to uh, this. Another uh, Timurid jade cup, which I don't have an image of, it's in the VNA collection, is inscribed with uh, Jahangir's name and the verse that uh, I translate. From the reflection of red wine, may the cup of jade always be like ruby, or in other words, may the cup always be full. So uh, the Jahangiri inscription on our cup includes the phrase life-sustaining or Jan Parvar, which would have uh, more logically uh, referred to wine rather than jewels. And so the metaphorical uh, reference between a wine cup and a casket are, um, are far more likely. So with that, I end. I hope uh, it has, the world of this cup has uh, gone beyond its, uh, its tiny size and scale. And I do hope to redisplay it so that you can use it on your tours uh, more often. And um, again, through all these various elements of its really stunning elegance and beauty, its rarity, and uh, its elegance. So you can be as convinced as I am that it is one of the masterpieces in our collection. So thank you.